What's cracking everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna do a little something different. So the other day, two days ago, Gil from the American Cholo was on a channel called the California Insider, I believe. California Insider, yes. I wrote a couple things down. Don't ever do this, but it was a great interview. Shout out to Gil. Shout out to the American Chono channel. If you guys aren't subscribed, subscribe to his channel. But I really want you guys to go over and, and check out that California Insider uh, episode with Gil. Uh, I thought it was a great video. thought it was a great interview. And I'll tell you how I, I came across it. Somebody got in my comments and they were like, hey, why don't you do a reaction to... Um, American Cholo, he was over there on this channel and he sounds like a Trump supporter, this, this, and, and when I read the comment, I started laughing and I was like, this guy must be new to the channel because he must not know that I am a conservative. Um, I don't know that Gil is a conservative. I know that um, I've known Gil, I've been knowing Gil through YouTube for several years now and I've seen his politics um, evolve. Um, and I applaud that because, um, my change to becoming a conservative while incarcerated is a direct result of what I saw in the California justice system. What I saw, who I saw was incarcerated next to me, who was filling up all the prisons and all the cells. And I had a party, I have a party in California who swears they're for the minority and for the people and they want to make positive change and yet they enact the most draconian laws in the nation that get followed up by other states. So I was forced to judge that the, the, the liberals by their actions rather than their words, right? But when I saw it, I said, you know what, let me, let me reach out to Gil. And Gil was like, go ahead, homie. You know, we might. So the thing is, we may not always all agree 100%, but as long as we're respectful in our disagreements, and that's what Gil and I have. Um, so let me get to it. I'm not going to do a, a, a formal reaction. I'm pretty sure that this video is going to be demonetized as it is. Um, and I didn't want to make it a really long video. Who knows? I, I get into this type of stuff. But there were three points that I wanted to talk about. And they're right at the beginning. I didn't see the whole video. Um, but I wanted to talk about these things. So um, the first one was that the Los Angeles District Attorney is not prosecuting juveniles that are being um, caught with guns. Now, uh, me personally... You know, it's 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 a double-edged sword for me. Being a former lifer, having had life in the California Department of Corrections, when you go before the board and the board and the board asks you why do you carry a gun, if you say for protection, the board's gonna eat you up. People carry guns, gang members carry guns to kill people. That's the answer they want, and that's the truth. Okay. Having said that, the reality is this. These kids are growing up in bad areas. If a cop catches a kid with a gun and confiscates the gun and lets him go, me personally, I don't have a problem with that. If a kid commits a crime with a gun, that's breaking the law. Charge him with that. I am not for the government deciding who can have a gun and who can't. Because that's a very slippery slope. And I know a lot of people are going to be like, what do you mean? I mean what I said. A kid carrying a gun because he knows he's in an area where people may want to gun him down. He's, he's putting himself on a level playing field. Again, if he uses the gun in a commission of a crime, then he should go to jail. We have to remember, I don't even know. Me having spent the majority of my life in jails and prisons... I don't even know what they do with juveniles anymore. The California Youth Authority, I believe, is shut down, right? So where do they send these kids? I don't know. But if they're going to send them to adult prisons, because I remember they opened up that juvenile thing in Tehachapi 
what, 10, 15 years ago, I think. Um, that's not a good idea. Um, I'm more for incarcerating, I mean, excuse me, educating than incarcerating. Um, and you know, I, the thing about these, 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 you know, I went through the system and I was hit with, with enhancements. And I feel like those enhancements, me personally, and what I saw during my incarceration, if you kill someone, there's already a life sentence for that. But it's been proven that if you are of a, a person of color and you kill someone, you will be hit with an enhancement that will stretch that life sentence out way more than if you're not a person of color. And I remember being in court and I was one of the first murder cases in the state to go all the way to trial for 186.22B. There's A and there's B. I think there's other ones now, but back then there was A and B. A, a was a three-year add-on or three-year sentence. B was, if you get convicted, give an example. I got convicted for uh, 15 to life plus five for the gun. So I got 20 to life. The way the enhancement was, was enacted was I would have to do the entire 15 plus half of any and all enhancements before I could even see the board. But another guy could have 20 to life with me, but didn't get hit with the enhancement and see the board in seven or 13 years, something like that. I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't in that category, so I wouldn't know. And I remember my, my attorney grilling um, the police officers, the detectives, and asking them about uh, a murder where some skinheads had uh, killed a Mexican because he was Mexican. And the detective said they had the same type of um, tattoos, dressed the same, all the criteria for a gang enhancement, right? And then my attorney said, so how many of them were charged with a gang enhancement? And he said, none. But yet they had prosecuted almost every Mexican, because there's not really a lot of black gangs in Santa Barbara. Every, pretty much every Mexican that was being prosecuted, they were hitting them with a gang enhancement. So I have issue with enhancements, period. I think that there are already, there are already um, laws on the books. And when we start adding enhancement, it's adding punishment on top of a punishment it just doesn't make sense to me. So again, the original uh, uh, question uh, having to do with um, why is the DA letting minors or letting juveniles off when they're caught with a weapon? I personally don't have a problem with it. Um, like I said, if they get caught committing a crime and people say, well, that's a crime yet. Yeah, it is a crime to carry a gun, but I think it's 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 a foolish law. You know, you have states like in Arizona where, you know, people get to carry everywhere they go. They don't have the, the, the amount of violence that we have. Right. So I think it's because when you know, well, hold up, he probably strapped up. It would it would make uh, people think twice. So there's that. Um, now. The second one that jumped out to me was uh, they had spoke about crime and gang activity in L.A. going through the roof. Right. Um, it's true. Right. It, it, it's true that crime and um, gang activity is going up, but it's going up everywhere. And. I give an example when Gil said it was about 18 months ago that he started noticing a difference. Well, we got a, a new president around that time who immediately um, began creating a situation for inflation to rise, gas prices to rise, um, cost of living to rise. And throughout the history of this country, when you have inflation rising the way that it did, when you have the cost of living rising the way it did, gangs and crime will go up. It always does in those situations. Um, I don't think that that the crime had to do with, um, let me put it like this. Gil, Gil touched on it. Gil mentioned the BLM movement, but it wasn't just the BLM movement. We have to be honest with ourselves. 
um, during the run up to the election, there were a lot of liberal politicians that were allowing their cities to burn, that were encouraging riots. They were saying peaceful protests. They weren't peaceful. They weren't definitely, they definitely weren't peaceful for the people that owned the businesses that were being looted. Um, you know, during that time with the looting and all, it's funny how people were so outraged that they had to loot the Nike store and the Apple store, you know, they were, they were getting possessions, materialistic things. And, um, allowing people to think that they can loot and they can pillage, they can, um, light things on fire and assault people without any, um, and without any uh, repercussions or incarceration, that was a problem, you know? And so when we have all these smash and grabs now, and now don't get me wrong, there is a law that's in California where if it's a certain amount, you know, it's a weird law that shouldn't have never been enacted, especially when you have these mom and pop places that can't survive um, their places being robbed like that. But there was a lot of different factors in that, right? Um, I'm getting a bunch of phone calls and messages right now. I apologize, you guys. But I think we need to to understand that it, it, it was an agenda that um, was encouraged by a political party in order to make a, a sitting president look bad that... Um, allowed for all, a lot of this stuff to, to start and it's biting them in the butt now. Um, if we can get our economy back where it needs to be, if we could get the cost of living back down, we would see a reduction in crime. Um, I think we just need to see the bigger picture. And then, again, this is only my two cents. And the last one I wanted to touch on, and this one is important to me. And this one, um, the host of the show brought up the fact that it costs over $100,000 per year to house an inmate in California. Well, that's a regular inmate. If you take in an, uh, 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 into account an inmate that has psychiatric services as part of his incarceration, is on medication, then it can go up to a whole lot more. Minimum $140,000 a year for those guys. My question is this. Why doesn't an outside entity audit the California Department of Corrections? It costs a hundred thousand or over a hundred thousand dollars a year to house an inmate in California. Look at the other states. Look at the states in the Southwest near California. How much does it cost to house those inmates and why is there such a big difference? Well, California is very political. California has as its most powerful union in our state, the CCPOA, which is the prison guards union, the most powerful. We have politicians in the capital of this state who are going to do whatever the CDC wants. They are more concerned with being reelected in their position of power than what is going on in their own backyard, their own districts. And that's a reality. I sat in prison for over 24 years. It was very rare to see a new handball, a new basketball, a new football, nets on the basketball court, new baseball gloves. Um, and mostly all that stuff is, is paid for by the by the inmate canteen. Where where is the money going? A lot of time during those 24 years, we were on lockdown. We were in our cell. What were they spending the money on? When is California going to be held accountable as far as the Department of Corrections and where that money goes? I think that our education budget needs to be a whole lot higher. Um, I think that 
The correction officer's pay should be lowered. Um, I think California should come more in line with the other states around us, what it costs to house the inmates there and what the COs get paid there. I think it's very, very irresponsible for the politicians in this state to turn a blind eye to the billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars being spent in our California Department of Corrections. I never call it the Department of Corrections, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation because that's not what I entered. I entered the CDC. I paroled from the CDCR and they were starting to enact programs to where you had a opportunity to rehabilitate. But from what I saw, the most rehabilitation people got was on their own. Finding like-minded individuals, studying together, doing groups together and stuff like that. I will tell you also that I was aware of, you know, they, would, they spent so much money to build a certain shop, right? But because of the nepotism in most of these prisons, the instructor that would be hired would be somebody's cousin or somebody's nephew, somebody's brother. And a lot of times that person wasn't certified in the area they were instructing in. So what that meant was those that graduate the program couldn't be certified. How could they be certified if the instructor isn't certified? So it's a good thing that they're learning stuff but the bad thing is the money is being wasted. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. So anyways, that's my little three points that I wanted to bring up based off, off of my experience, uh, my life experiences, and um, my point of view. I appreciate you guys watching the video. Uh, hopefully you guys will leave a comment, share the video, and uh, if you're not already subscribed, subscribe to the channel. Everybody be safe, be smart, and tell the ones you love that you love them. I'm out.